And that was the first time that I actually heard of the terminology environmental justice. That was the first time that I was able to start making these connections of why is it that a lot of my family members have asthma where we're experiencing a drought like we've never seen before. And I think that's one of the, the main uh, elements that we need to, to work. It's empowering our community. If we don't do the work in our own circles, in our own families, in our own neighborhoods, at our own schools, at our own workplaces, on, on the public bus, at the dinner table. We need to have those conversations first. This conversation is incredibly important and timely as our nation continues to grapple with the pervasive systemic racism, including in our environmental, energy, and healthcare systems. Hello and welcome to the Green Table Talk. My name is Latricia Adams, founder, CEO, and president of Black Millennials for Flint. And surprised, I am the guest co-host for tonight's episode. Um, I'm really excited um, about the content that we have tonight. Um, this month is National Minority Health Month. I do want to say I feel a way about minorities. Some use air quotes because they're really not the minority. Black and brown people are the majority. Um, but really excited to speak to some experts in the field um, to talk about the, the topic of let's keep it 100: white supremacy and environmental health, and specifically how it impacts Black, Latinx, and Indigenous communities. Um, so it is with absolute pleasure that I turn it over to my co-host for this evening, Ms. Karina Martinez. Hi everyone, it's so good to be here with you. I'm Karina Martinez, I'm the Communications Director for Corazón Latino, and I'm so excited for my first time with Latricia on and also our wonderful guests. Awesome. So I'm going to kick it to these dope, this dope brother and sister, um, Dr. Patrick Thompson and Michelle Mapson. Um, we'll start with Dr. Thompson. If you could just do a quick intro for the people, let the people know who you are and, and, and what you do and what you'll be contributing to this space tonight. Uh, absolutely. I'm uh, honored to be here tonight. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Patrick Thompson. I am uh, the Chief Healing Officer of Old Kingdom wellness, which is a concierge medical practice that focuses on our holistic health solutions um, and also have the privilege of serving uh, as the uh, health, wellness, and food justice consultant for Black Millennials for Flint. First of all, I just want to get into like how how dope like that description is a chief healing officer. Yes, <laughs> let that marinate in your spirit. Yes, it already sounds like it's about to be a dope conversation. Um, and happy to introduce a girl that changed my life. But I digress. Miss um, Michelle Mapson. Hi, thank you for having me. Super excited. This is my first Green Table Talk. Um, but I am one of the co-founders alongside Latricia of Black Millennials for Flint and the Chief Advocacy Officer. Um, so my background is, as, is in, as an environmental health scientist. Um, so I bring um, some of the kind of technical expertise to the table um, and connecting the dots between the health disparities around lead, lead poisoning, um, and the cumulative impact that can have on our health. So happy to be here today and be co-hosting or be seeing these wonderful co-hosts, including um, our lovely founder, Latricia. So thank you. All right. So let's get straight into this green table talk. Ooh, this conversation is going to be good. So much of tonight's discussion will focus on the teachings and quotes from a good sis sister, um, Harriet Washington. If you are not familiar with the genius and Black girl magic um, that is Harriet Washington, um, I hope that you definitely get into it. We'll make sure to drop um, a link so you can check out some of her um, books and writings. But Harry Washington is globally acclaimed as a public health expert, particularly as it relates to unearthing the inherently racist practices that disproportionately impact Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people in the healthcare field. So one of the most powerful quotes, and, and I'm biased, one of my favorite quotes from here at Washington is, of all the forms of inequality and justice in health is the most shocking 
and the most inhumane. And so that comes from um, a book that we use a lot um, with our leadership program with Black Millennials for Flint, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. So we're gonna kick this off with Dr. Thompson. So Dr. Thompson, um, as, as a physician, can you talk to us about what led you down this pathway to holistic medicine and why it's so critical for Black, Latinx, and Indigenous folks to, to consider? Oh, I'm, I'm, this is a great question. I'm glad that, to, to answer that question. But I, I gotta say first, if, if, if you're not, if you, if you're not uh, 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 understanding Understanding or, or, or knowledgeable about the racist practices, I encourage you to read that that uh, Harry Washington book, uh, Medical Apartheid. Uh, one of the best books you can read about it. Wonderful and gives you, you know, from even from a historical standpoint, why this is an important conversation. But to this question, um, as a naturopathic physician, um, you know, if you're not aware of what that means, it's uh, basically as a primary care physician uh, that focuses on on basically on natural therapeutics. Um, you know. Uh, one of the reasons why I decided to do that instead of a conventional medical doctor go to holistic medicine, uh, you know, it started when I was a young child. You know, I had family members, uh, you know, people in my neighborhood who, for instance, I, my understanding was that they would go to the hospital for what 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 was, was called routine illnesses and issues, and they wouldn't come back home. Uh, I, I saw in my own immediate family, uh, my mother, my my, my grandparents, uh, aunts, uncles who were taking so many medications and they really were not, I could tell they really weren't sure exactly what, what those things were doing to them or they weren't necessarily sure what the, really the goal of this was supposed to be, you know? Uh, and so there seemed to be some sort of disconnect. There was a disconnect there. Um, and, and, you know, uh, you know, th th there was a disconnect between, you know, them understanding, you know, uh, what, what, the, what medicines are about, but really what health was about. Um, it really was about just quote unquote making them feel better, but we but but we've learned that you know uh, there's some you know you know um, majority folks uh, white people who would receive certain certain care that <laughs> that they just wouldn't even get off. Um, and so and so with that being said, you know I, I think it's you know to the question. I mean I think it is critical for 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 Black African American Latino Indigenous people. To, to really look into what, what holistic medicine is about and what it can bring to you. And one of the main reasons is because simply for me, it, it, it's something I would dare say historically and broadly around the world was, was developed and designed for you by you, by people like you. Um, and, and when you, and, and, and when you, and when you uh, seek out natural, um, natural medicine or holistic medicine, you know, it gives you an opportunity to really reconnect with with who you are and really uh, an, an opportunity to counteract, uh, you know, a, a, a system that was designed to literally boldly uh, and systematically destroy you. <laughs> uh, and so, and so uh, you know, uh, holistic medicine is an opportunity for, for um, Black, Latino, Indigenous people to really reclaim the reins of their own health by, with the system that was designed for them by them. It's a, it's it's an it's, it's it's a way uh, to me it's an avenue by which you can be, begin to reclaim your own health and reclaim the health of your communities, begin to reclaim uh, the the relationship between you, your community, and the earth, and how that affects your health. Uh, an, an opportunity to reclaim your own well being, an opportunity to reclaim the health and the safety the safety of your own communities, and so um, to me it's it's a, it's it's a very critical. A critical, 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 critical uh, thing to do. Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned that, um, Dr. Thompson. I can just say from my own experience, I have a back background in public health, and there weren't a lot of people who looked like us um, in that field. And also, um, some of the things that we were taught just were just made it didn't make any sense at all. Like, for example, if for determinants of health, if we wanted to be healthier, one of our suggestions in the textbook on our screens was be less poor, don't be poor. Um, so it's, just, it's just crazy. Like some of these things, like you said, the system was just clearly not designed for us. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, black women. Um, black women suffer the highest rates of stress and major depression in the nation and suicide rates soared 200% among young black men within just 20 years. 
um, so Black men and women. Um, Michelle, how do environmental factors such as lead poisoning, extreme heat, and additional environmental justices and the climate crisis contribute to mental health issues and other chronic illnesses? Yeah, kind of jumping right in. I feel like that um, really does unpack a lot. Um, and just going to your point, Karina, about this idea of social determinants of health as if people can just sort of pull themselves out of um, situations that have taken centuries to, um, to, to make, it's, it's pretty incredulous. But um, to your question, I think one important aspect that we have to keep in mind, especially with something like lead, which is a um, heavy metal, it's not something, this type of exposure, um, whether it's smaller exposures or, or full-blown lead poisoning, it's not happening in a vacuum. And um, so we have to understand the reality is that people are um, being exposed to a number, a myriad of different environmental toxicants, whether it's in our air pollution or in our water, um, both in and outside of the home. And so when we think of lead, which we always talk about as being a powerful neurotoxin, and uh, we know that it can cause um, brain damage and damage to the nervous system, um, we know that it's linked to behavioral problems and decrements in IQ. Um, and this really plays out, especially for young people, um, as potentially a decreased ability to pay attention in school, underperformance in school, um, and in more serious cases, even development and hearing and speech problems. And so I think all of this is germane when we're talking about um, a person's quality of life, and especially when we're talking about mental health. These are cumulative impacts happening over time, and so that decline is not necessarily seeming to happen overnight, um, but that's often, especially with mental health, these are chronic illnesses that we're talking about. Um, so when you add something like climate change to the mix, and we're talking about um, what we're already seeing today, the effects can be even more devastating um, than what I've described. And I mean, there are numerous examples already. If you look at um, super fun sites around our country, which are simply just pieces of land that um, are no longer in operation, but at one point were um, full-blown industrial sites and they've been designated as some of the most contaminated places in our country. Um, they might have anything from lead and other heavy metals like arsenic, um, or hexavalent chromium, things that we should not have in our bodies. Um, they're contained in the site, but during massive flooding events, like even with Hurricane Harvey and the increased um, hurricanes that we're seeing, especially in the Gulf, we're also seeing the mobilization of these contaminants into our soil, into properties nearby, into groundwater nearby. And that's just one example. If you move further west and you go out to California, we see these wildfires, this massive degradation of vegetation um, due to these fires um, that causes contamination of drinking water sources. Because if you can imagine, if you've ever been in San Francisco, and even though the fire might be happening hundreds of miles away, you can still see the soot in the air. You can still see the heaviness. Maybe the, the view of the sun's obstructed. Well, that's all air particulate matter. Um, small um, particles that are being um, upended from these wildfires and distributed many, many miles from their source. And so we're already seeing um, additional contamination in our waterways um, and parts in the, out west just from these fires alone. And so these are natural disasters. These are events that are being exacerbated by climate change. But if we're not monitoring and understanding the potential impact it could have um, on, on what would otherwise be potentially uncontaminated sources, other parts of the country, then we might be missing harmful um, impacts. And so just to kind of go back to this question of mental health. Um, and I said before, mental health, we often think of as chronic illnesses. And it's unfortunately the case that um, it takes a long time for these things to be treated. And so for something like lead, which again is a neurotoxin and it's, in, innate, it's impacting a child's ability to perform to a certain standard, imagine again what that's doing over time. Um, and often we're not accounting again for that cumulative effect over time. So what may look like underperformance in school will then result in being unable to obtain the credentials needed um, to succeed in a work environment. So there's loss of productivity. Um, and that's measurable in dollars and cents. That's exactly how we look at the, the benefit of eradicating something like lead poisoning um, versus how much it would cost. It costs us every year in productivity. 
Um, and I'll just finally say when we're talking about these chronic illnesses like depression, lead poisoning has also been linked to schizophrenia and other clinical disorders. Um, and we also talked a little bit earlier, Karina, you mentioned just the increasing temperatures and heat island effects. Well, there's also a link with increasing temperature and criminal activity. People are just more irritable. People are also more prone to going to the hospitals. Um, being, there's increased hospitalization from suicide, depression, stress, all kinds of things um, when we talk about a warming world. So um, really, we have to not be thinking about these things in a silo and a vacuum like they're happening independently because really they're happening currently um, as we see the climate changing. These are going to continue to be worsening phenomenon um, if we don't address them now. So I'll, I'll stop there. Wow, it's a lot to unpack um, right there, but it's also true. And I, I feel like we, we see this with the people around us, you know, black and brown communities are exposed to all of this at just proportional rates. Um, many immigrants of mixed status of, or of mixed immigration status who are eligible for healthcare coverage remain uninsured because immigrant families face a range of enrollment barriers, including fear or confusion about eligibility policies or difficulty navigating the enrollment processes and language and literacy challenges. Uh, Dr. Thompson, what has been your experience working with immigrant patients and what advice would you provide to other healthcare professionals to encourage equitable treatment and care? Yeah, yeah. Again, again, another great question. Uh, you know, when I, when I think about my own experience with immigrant uh, patients, uh, definitely there's that fear. I mean, you know, sometimes you can see it in their eyes. It's, it's, it's a hesitance to sometimes to walk in the door or walk in the room to, you know, looking around, what 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 do I need to do next? I mean, uh, oftentimes that ends up being some level of language barrier, even, you know, from that level. Uh, and to, and so, 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 so there's that fear. Uh, so, so for my experience, there's kind of two parts there. One is an opportunity to be a bridge for them um, and doing my best to sort of accommodate whatever environmental issues going on um, in terms of access, right? Um, to to um, be, you know, uh, especially dil diligent in getting them paperwork, say, for instance, maybe in a different language or, um, you know, or even getting somebody in that can talk, you know, the, you know, the same language and, you know, as, and, you know, as, as they will allow. Um, and so, and so, and so uh, you know, you got to understand many of them are coming from a places that have completely different healthcare systems. If, if any, any that's really organized as a, as a Western medical uh, establishments, establishments are. And so, you know, that, that, that has a, you know, that has a huge impact on, you know, following the protocols and, 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 uh, uh, you know, in, in intervention, um, uh, follow through into that nature. But secondly, you know, what I found is, um, as, as being that bridge and, and one that is more open to uh, some of the things that they may bring to the table. Um, I've noticed that many of them may come from different systems, but 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 many of them are are very much aware in a in, in a and uh, they're they're using uh, coming from systems or even family things where they are uh, family systems where they where they are very much aware of say uh, botanical remedies and things you know. That, you know, we, we, I might be talking about certain pills, but but then they and, and, and I, I found through some conversations, they'll ask me, hey, you know, in my country we use this root <laughs> for the same thing, and so and so you know, and so we can have this conversation. Oh yeah, you, hey, you're right. Let's let's talk about this, right? And so and so, uh, you know, being that bridge, you know, and, and in some sense, it's almost an opportunity for me to 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 really, in some sense, learn from them. Say, hey, you know, what do y'all do, man? You know. And, and try to incorporate that in to what 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 I understand, you know, uh, and, you know, for my own training, and and I think even trying to make that bridge makes them a lot more comfortable to see somebody that may look like them first of all, but then to come and talk, talk the same language that they may be used to hearing since they was a kid. Yeah, in this in our language, we call this root this, and this and, and oh, we we call it this in this country, right? But it's the same thing, so it makes them it, it makes them uh, much more. Um, open and 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 uh willing to to really uh receive what you're trying to give to them um so uh you know what what i say to other healthcare professionals i mean listen we we, we gotta you know you got, gotta, gotta put more energy in, into really trying to understand the, the patients that you're that you're that you're treating 
um, my experience and even going to doctors myself from a Western perspective, you know, I, I felt like I was a lab result. You know, I, I you know, uh, I I've, I've, I felt like there was this ideal patient that I needed to fit into. You know, when you have a certain illness, everybody takes this, right? Well, you know, um, as many of us may understand that that may not necessarily be the case for everybody's um, physiology and biochemistry. Um, and so, so you know, it, it, it's it's um, now I, I will say that that um, there is some energy right now that I've seen where some folks are trying to, you know, make some minimal effort to educate physicians on a variety of uh, immigrants or or uh, ethnicities and, and cultures that they may um, possibly see. You know, I've lived in some international cities like French living in Miami, for instance. You know, you gotta you, you gotta know some about uh, uh, Latino culture. You gotta know something about Asian Creole culture to really be effective in those in those spaces. But the reality is, is that it's not enough effort to do that. And so, there's so many people who are still struggling because they 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 want to be healthy. They're in a different country. They're in a different medical system, and nobody's speaking their language. The people are not speaking their language, and and and. And in some sense, when they do mention something that may be a cultural nuance to the physician, they're kind of met with these looks and, well, okay, okay, let's let's not talk, let's let's not do this. Like we're gonna we're gonna give you some real medicine, you know. And, and, and so if, if if you approach someone in that way, they're not gonna really be, want to receive that, and eventually that's going to you know, it's, it's going to impede um, um, adherence to medical protocols and and the health in general. Yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Thompson. Um, I know I'm, that just made me think back to um, in my my younger years, even though I'm still 25 multiple times over, um, I remember like studying abroad in Costa Rica and then like later on going to the DR and <laughs> terms being completely different, right? Like things that I had learned like meaning something completely different and how that would manifest with trying to communicate about something so critical as your health. So I appreciate you uplifting that and really essentially uh, doing a call to action where um, as healthcare professionals, you have to grapple with those nuances um, surrounding not just variation in, in language, just, but just with culture. And it takes full immersion um, into uh, diverse communities of, of color to really understand how to best serve um, patients. So I, I appreciate you sharing that uh, perspective. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, um, so I still uplifting um, our good sis here at Washington. Um, so historically, African Americans have been subjective to ooh, horrific um, exploitation, um, abusive and voluntary experimentation. I would be remiss if I did not mention like the Tuskegee experiments, for example, um, at a rate far higher than any other ethnic group. So even uh, recently, um, with the Flint water crisis, um, with it being nearly a decade at eight years um, since the switch to the Flint River occurred, um, we see this justifiable distrust between communities of color, um, government, uh, elected officials, but then also with healthcare providers. Um, so Michelle, how have we seen the, the trauma from historical and current medical experimentation um, impact African-Americans, Latinx folks, and indigenous folks as it relates to accessibility to healthcare? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you named so much there and there's a lot there to unpack too. Um, I feel like the, there's a lot of documentation that we have nowadays, a lot of access to information um, that really describes the sorted sadistic history um, of trauma and experimentation. And I would dare to say things that we probably may never know, things that maybe weren't documented on purpose that just have not yet been unearthed about some of the atrocities that um, have happened among people in this country, um, perpetuated by white supremacy. And so, um, I mean, it's, it's even just in looking on my daily, like, 
just scrolling through Twitter, I was actually just looking at um, a, a story just today. And a um, Black woman was recounting her experience with a medical professional, a paramedic in particular. And this Black woman just happened to be a medical student. So obviously fairly um, versed and knowledgeable, a subject matter expert in, in healthcare um, as, as one could be. And um, she was arguing on behalf of her mother who had suffered from like an intense nosebleed or something that no one understood the cause. But the paramedic, a white man said, well, your mother, um, you know, is, is probably hypertensive and probably something due to her medication that's causing it. And so they literally walked through the medication list. Um, the paramedic was completely incorrect. And ultimately, they did um, bring her mother to the hospital. And lo and behold, there was a need for extensive care, um, something that if it hadn't been caught in time may have been fatal to this woman. Um, and so I think it's a cautionary tale, um, but also a very real experience that likely happens every single day, um, except that you may not have a, a medical student or a doctor advocate in your corner who's asking the questions and making sure that care is actually rendered. Um, and you can only imagine the detriment to life that that has. So I think there um, today are extreme examples um, that are actually just commonplace as extreme as they might sound. They happen to us all the time. Um, but there's also no doubt that the historical trauma, the very real experimentation, um, as you named uh, Latricia, um, that's happened at the expense of Black and Indigenous communities here in this country um, that, again, we may not even know of, some of which we're continuing well into um, the most recent decades of our history. Um, and we're even being perpetuated by our own federal government. You talk about syphilis and the Tuskegee experiment. And I think about, um, I'm going to be starting a doctorate program at Johns Hopkins University at the Bloomberg School of Public Health in just a couple of months. And I have to recognize the history from Kennedy Krieger, which was a um, center that was um, located in Baltimore um, and affiliated with Johns Hopkins, where they were um, knowingly um, not treating Black um, children for lead poisoning, um, even though there were some interventions that might have helped or they could have removed them as they were detecting high levels of, um, of lead. And so this was happening, what I think, in my own lifetime in the, um, up until the 80s, 90s. So all of that to say, our own trusted institutions have um, perpetuated this harm on our bodies. Um, our sister Harriet Washington, who is a brilliant science writer, has captured this um, in her book talking about medical apartheid. And she discusses, again, that statistic history of experimentation, like around especially Black women and these big names, the person we might herald as the father of gynecology, Dr. Um, J. Marion Sims, who ultimately was found to be experimenting on Black women because why? They couldn't say no. This is during um, enslavement. And while a lot of the advancements we have on hysterectomies and things that um, are helpful to make sure women um, um, or childbearing women are not able, were not suffering, I should say, from, um, from senseless death was on the backs and on the death of, um, of those who were experimented upon without giving anesthetics, without um, any regard for actually trying to treat or heal these individuals. That person, Dr. Sims, went on to be um, named as the head of the National Medical Association. Imagine the trickle down effect that that has when the decision maker at that level, someone who's supposed to be trusted in the, in the medical community had actually, actually been perpetuating that harm. It's not hard to imagine um, how that type of thinking was not, on, was not only just um, his, it was commonplace across the profession. Um, and so we see that today, especially um, there are conversations we know from studies that um, medical physicians, they don't believe white, um, excuse me, they don't believe blacks uh, feel pain the same way as white patients. There is, li this is literally just a myth. There is no scientific evidence to support this, yet that is a racial bias that exists. And, and we see it play out in medical interventions um, and the amount of medication that might be rendered um, or not rendered because of a person's skin color. Um, so for me, it's really no wonder when we talk about um, the mistrust the, or the distrust, I should say, that um, folks may have for the healthcare field and for uh, medical institutions because they haven't historically been 
not only just for us, but actually um, um, demonstrably treat, treating us in a way that's equitable, in a way that actually is healing. Um, certainly not like what Dr. Thompson does and what he's describing. This is not um, what's happening, especially in Western medicine. Um, so I think when we're, we're thinking about the fact that um, for Black women, especially breast cancer, for instance, is something that we still suffer um, from at later stages and may even die from. Well, part of that is because we may decide not to go to the hospital or go to our regular checkups until we think something is wrong. And it might be too late because there is a mistrust or distrust of um, those institutions. So you, you, you limit the amount of time you have to spend interacting with them because who wants to suffer from microaggressions just going to pay somebody to take care of you. So I do um, recognize that it's really this racist mythology that continues to persist today. That's really where um, where we would be able to get to the root of, of why this type of trauma is still seen in this in our medical system. Um, and until we start to really unpack that and remove, remove that from its root, um, I think we'll still see some of the health disparities we see that exist today and the reasons that folks may choose not to opt into Western healthcare um, as it exists. Yeah, and I mean, we know this information, we know this history, this, this awful history. Um, and so, you know, we'd expect to see more action being taken. Um, Dr. Thompson and Michelle, there's been an overwhelming controversy right now surrounding the Biden-Harris administration um, because they've completely shied away from including race in the climate justice, screen, climate justice screening tool. And, you know, as we're seeing with these examples, race is a really important component right now because not everyone is getting the same types of treatment or access um, to things. So including race in the climate justice screening tool would be very significant for our Black and Brown communities. So Black Millennials for Flint, founder and CEO, our very own Latricia Adams, um, spoke on record at a recent White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council meeting stay, stating, and I'm just going to say it for you, <laughs> exclusion of race is disrespectful and a slap in the face to every Black and Brown person that has been advocating for decades for us to get to this point where literally they tell Black and Brown people that we don't matter. So how do you think this lack of inclusion of race will impact environmental health outcomes and variables specifically for Black, Latino, Latinx, and Indigenous people? Uh, I guess I can, I guess I'll go. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> there's so much I can say about this. Uh, but I, I, I'll just say this, you know, statistically, when you look at areas in this country, that are predominantly uh, what you know minorities as we doing quotes here, minority areas in this country. You will find statistically that they are leading in the worst, uh, in, in the worst uh, ways in, in, from an environmental health perspective. You know, the, these are the communities that are having, you know, the most incidences of water pollution, the most incidences of exposure to pollutions, air pollutions, the most, um, you know making them dumb sites, you know, you got extreme cancer racing of these things. And, you know, so for the Biden, Biden Harris administration to want to make that something that's not important or or not based their, you know, not 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 based their uh, uh impact on environmental health on not having race to be in, to be in there, I mean it, it it's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's preposterous. It's ludicrous. What other word can I say? I mean it, it makes absolutely no sense, and and on top of that, it's, it, it it will be devastating to any progress that we would make to make the environmental health in these communities better. Because if because if because if race is not important, then how are you gonna know where to focus this stuff? How are you gonna know where to focus the work? Because that is the main determinant, one of the main determinants on where those problems are. So, so, so you, 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 you're putting a devastating, uh, you, 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 uh, you devastatingly cripple the efforts to improve environmental health in these communities. Look, if I can take a stab at that, and thank you, Dr. Thompson, I feel like it took words out of my mouth, especially when we're talking about the incredible amount of um, historical and current pollution um, and the way that plays out in our 
um, and health outcomes in communities that are already burdened. And we know the number one indicator for where sites of pollution are located is race. It doesn't matter your income. Um, it's a very real, um, real issue that really should not be neutral because racism isn't neutral. Um, and so uh, to be fair, I do understand why um, folks are saying, well, race should not be an indicator in this. We should remain race neutral. And a, and a part of that um, is actually just a litigious one. It's simply litigation related, meaning that there's a fear that including race as a determining factor for this type of this large um, initiative, the amount of monies that are coming down is very much going to trigger legal challenges. It can slow down the implementation and the use of this tool, both of the tool itself and for the dissemination of the Justice 40 um, resources. So yes, that is a concern we'll hear uh, from, from the legal community and, and really what ultimately is, I think, why this administration chose to move forward as it is remaining race neutral. But it's like Dr. Collins has said, it's like you're, there's decades of information that has shown um, both research and scholarship, um, incredible amounts of information that shows, again, that race is that single indicator, regardless of income levels. And so hitting close to home, me living in Washington, D.C., this is hugely concerning because I know that a, a county like Prince George's County, which is heralded and known as one of the most wealthiest, one of the wealthiest counties in which Black folks live, which is amazing, um, Prince George's in Maryland is also facing um, some issues around potentially unwanted land uses um, in their in their community. So these are facilities that have the um, polluting power that may have not been that has never been experienced in this community. So arguably, the wealthiest place in this nation is still being slated for this type of um, for this type of action. And historically, it's our communities, Black communities, but also Latinx and Indigenous communities that have just been unsuccessful with blocking these actions, um, whether we just don't have the political power or we're just not listened to. So imagine like what these kind of resources can do to actually empower people to be at the decision making table that they may not otherwise have if you just say we're race neutral. Um, so for me, it's especially frustrating because we know the urgency around climate change. We know that now is the time to think about this and to make adaptation decisions that can actually prevent people from being harmed as is. So we just can't afford to tiptoe around this issue, like this idea of race and being race neutral just because of the threat of litigation. And most likely this is going to be challenged in the courts anyway. And so for the administration not to take a bold move and bold action is, Pretty, again, it's incredulous. There's just really no reason for it. Um, and finally, I'll just say, and I said this before, like I think one of the most disturbing aspects that um, is, is the fact that this is race neutral, this tool in and of itself, is it's gonna mask the outright um, missing potential um, in disadvantaged communities. So communities that um, may be surrounded by a wealthier community or, or where segregation is so distinct that um, you may be looking at as a small sort of geographical level, but actually missing what's happening in someone's neighborhood, where in that neighborhood gentrification might be happening, but it is still considered a quote unquote disadvantaged community. You're not going to get to see that if we're race neutral. And again, racism has never been race neutral. So um, it's disturbing to me. And, and I really do hope that since this is in its um, sort of draft phase, if you will, hasn't been completely um, rolled out that they really seriously consider the very real EJ advocates who've been saying, like Latrizia, okay, that this is not acceptable, that it's a slap in the face, because it truly is. Yes, go off team of panelists. That, um, oh, y'all, just um, the amount of time not just my time, but our ancestors, y'all, people that literally are dead, that have been black and brown people who are dead, like Dana Alston, Wilma Mankiller, people who are dead, that have been advocating for <laughs> just to be seen and in this space for you to just be like, no, nah, I'm, I'm good. Like it really speaks to, and I'm just gonna be 100% like real, and, and speak truth is cowardly. 
you already know when you even uplifted the terminology environmental justice that that has underpinnings of race. And so we don't have time for these moderate antics for how we approach environmental justice. It's not justice if you're not including race. But I digress because I already spoke, you know, my piece on, on record, but um, that, that is a, a place that's a very sore spot um, in, in the EJ community. And it has been at the same time, very uplifting and encouraging to hear the outpouring of support um, from allies, from other uh, grassroots organizations that are calling out um, this administration for not handling in the, this in a way in which environmental justice literally is structured because it's still grounded in environmental racism. If you can't talk about race, you're really not trying to solve any issues. But to wrap that up, <laughs> <laughs> that was with some spice. Um, Dr. Thompson uh, and Michelle, a as we do move forward um, into this last question, uh, what is one last piece of advice or a call to action that you would give to our, our viewers tonight? Michelle, so would you like to go first this time? <laughs> you know, you were, you were thinking the same, so I was like, I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean... This was a great conversation and I'm a bit biased because I mean, I didn't even, I was like, Tracy, you guys are going to call it Tracy. I need to make sure I'm prepared. I have the utmost respect for the individuals on, in this, on this call, in this space. Um, and first of all, we, we talked about some heavy stuff today. So I'm going to take a collective moment, a collective breath. I urge y'all to do the same because like, this is a lot, this is heavy. Um, and it just, to me, serves as a reminder um, that I would be burnt out. I know many of us will be burnt out if you didn't have a community in this space. If you were researching and trying to understand these topics on their own and not have a place to have discourse, not have a place to talk with like-minded individuals who understand and who care um, and are about that, about that action, about the movement, about the work. So for me, um, if, if you're listening and you don't already have those individuals, I mean, it's really easier than ever before to connect with folks virtually or online um, if you can't connect in your own community. But I think it's imperative that you have both people, like I said, that you're willing to fight with and fight beside, but also that you can celebrate and have support and think about, you know, I, I transparently had to step back from my role in Black Millennials for Flint due to the death of my mother earlier this year. I had to take time away, even though that was the most time that I had spent away from this type of work. And I'm so grateful to folk, to Latricia and even to Dr. Thompson, who was praying over me and saying, you know, don't worry, we'll handle this. We got this. And when you're ready to come back. We're here. And it makes me feel emotional, but I trust these people. And I hope that folks out there listening can find that, that, um, that trust in their community because you really need this. Like, we're not yet older. We have maybe several decades left of work in us and fight in us. Um, I look at my, my aunt Peggy Shepard and she's been in the game since before I was born. So it takes a lot. If, they, if she didn't have that community, then it would be impossible to do this work on your own. So just find that support, find that tribe, if you will. Um, I have found it with Black Males for Flint and those in our um, umbrella and our network and it's amazing. So, um, and the last thing I'll say is just like, I work in the environmental space. So a lot of this is really just in my wheelhouse. I think about these things all the time, every day, but it doesn't matter what space you're in, like whether you do finance or immigration or labor movement work or education, like there's a place for you in this space. Um, when we're talking about the environment, it's everything. It's what we are living right now, but it's also what our children are going to inherit from us. And so protecting this space is so vital, but it means that there's just an innumerable amount of ways to use your own talents. Uh, Tracy would like to say, to use your ministry. What, what are the gifts that you've been given um, to, to give to this world? But you can do that in this space, in the environmental space. And we especially need that from millennials and Gen Z, from young people to step into these leadership positions because um, it's just an urgent place to be. So I'll stop there and, and just leave y'all with that. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, listen, I, I could tell I want to piggyback on that. Um, 
you know, one thing I would say uh, to, you know, as a call to action, we got to start changing our mindsets. Uh, our mindsets needs to be how, how, how can we change where we are so that those that are coming behind us will be better? And, and, and that's the challenge. And so, and, you know, and I think, you know, if, if we can shift our minds to start doing everything we're doing, it's not all about us per se and, and all about what's like right now, but our right now needs to be in preparation for the future. Because if we don't take care of right now, it won't be, <laughs> you know, the future is going to be bleak. So, so what does that look like practically for me, you know, in, in my view is, you know, remembering that you are a con contrary to what is being said about us in the mainstream of this, of this country, in this society. We are not powerless, but we are powerful beyond, beyond measure. We might be tired, but we still have the power on the inside of us to begin to take the reins of our health in our own environments. It, it, it may be small steps, but the small steps combined can become a movement. And so I want to encourage everyone who's listening, listen, how, how, how do you start taking control of your environment? Listen, be aware, have the awareness of what's going on around you. Okay. In, in, educate, educate yourself on what's going on in your community in terms of noise pollution, air pollution, water pollution. Uh, you know, you know, educate yourself on, 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 on what they're trying to put into your community, things of that nature. Um, Start a, a urban garden in your community. Uh, walk, ride and walk, walk around your, your neighborhood. Ride a, ride a bike. Recycle. Stop throwing stuff out the window. Come on, somebody. Listen, I see that too much. Stop throwing stuff out the window. <laughs> no, you, you're messing up your own community. Okay. And, 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 you know, conserve energy. I mean, things of that nature. And if we start doing those things, with with the thought in mind, I'm making this better for those coming behind us. Then I think we can make some some progress. Oh, child, we can keep this conversation going and going. I mean, I would love to to end on an inspirational note, and I, I really appreciate the contributions um, from you, Dr. Thompson, um, as well as Michelle. Um, this work is heavy, um, but guess what? Too much. Whom is, to, to whom much is given, much is expected. And we have huge shoes to fill, um, you know, just in the honor of our ancestors. And our elders are tired. They're tired. And we owe that to them to maintain and carry this torch um, until we finally get to that, that promised land where regardless of um, color or social economic status that we have access to truly live abundantly and clean and pure environments. Um, so with that, thank you all so much uh, to my co-host, um, as I'm the guest co-host. Um, thank you, Karina, for allowing me to share this space. Um, and again, um, thank you so much again, Dr. Thompson and Michelle for this amazing conversation um, that I think will really bless somebody tonight. And with that, we hope to see you again um, in May for the next episode of our Green Table Talk. But until then, stay blessed. Peace.